Hey there, Pastor Eric here from Connection Church in Columbia, Tennessee. The message that you're about to hear, we truly believe is going to be a blessing to you. So our request of you is if it does bless you, that you'll take and you'll share it with others. We want, like everything, for people to be connected with Jesus. Our desire is for you to be connected with Jesus. Our prayer is that you would be connected with Jesus. But if you share this message with others, they'll be connected with Jesus too. God bless you. Amen. Church. Whew. I fully mean that. I don't, I don't want that presence to, to end now. I don't want that feeling of being in his glory to end now that we're transitioning to sitting down. I don't want to feel like we're moving into another portion so we can just be distracted or other things or check my phone. I want to stay honed in on his presence. I want to stay honed in right here where his word is going to speak to us this morning. I am excited to bring this message this morning, if you can't tell. <laughs> I'm excited to bring this message because this is life-changing for me. This is what I think that he's calling us into next. I think this is the next step. We've been talking over the last few weeks about strongholds, strongholds of the enemy. Three weeks ago, we talked about taking back territory. And we talked about first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we talked about the divine power for tearing down of strongholds. And we've been talking about how the enemy can come into our lives and set up camp in an area. And it can start off someplace small, uh, like Andrea talked about last week, something, or not something small, that wasn't something small for her, but an event that happens when you're younger that the enemy starts feeding lies into, and then it just builds into a fortress, a, a fortified city, a stronghold in your life that is taking up space that he was never meant to take up. And we've been talking about we're being restored by fire, about how Peter was restored by the fire with Christ. And then last week, we talked about the stronghold of hurt. We talked about how Pastor Eric and Andrea gave their testimony about how the Lord has changed and how we had practical steps of how to attack and go after the strongholds that the enemy has placed in our lives and set up camp. And we want to take back those strongholds. Amen? Amen. We want to take those back, but I want to start by taking back the word stronghold. I want to start by taking back that word. Because you know that the word stronghold is in scripture 68 times. 53 of those times to describe a physical fortress, a place, it's a, it's a, fort, a fortified city or something like that. 53 of those times, one time in scripture does it describe a stronghold as a place that the enemy can take in your life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, to, we have a divine power to tear down his strongholds. One time in scripture does it describe a stronghold as something that the enemy can set up in your life. 14 times it talks about the Lord being our stronghold. I want to reclaim that name as a name and an attribute that I want to place on God because that's our true stronghold. I want to take it back from the enemy. And so when we say the word stronghold, I don't want it to be a negative feeling. I want it to be something that points us to God, our stronghold in life. And I think that's what we've been talking about, fixing our attention. And we've been fixing our focus. And where's your focus? Where's your attention? I want to fix it on the stronghold of my life, my God, my Lord and Savior, my refuge, my high tower, my strength. I want to put it in him. It's all over scripture. Psalm 18, 2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in a time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them from the wicked and saves them. Because they take refuge in him. That was Psalm uh, 37. Psalm 91 says, But the Lord has become my stronghold, my God, the rock of my refuge. Isaiah 25 says, For you have been the stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in distress, a shelter from the storm and shade from the heat. I could keep going, but you get the point. 
Scripture repetitively says that the Lord our God is our stronghold. And we need to stop and we need to fix our focus and our attention on the stronghold of the Lord. I'm tired of looking at the enemy. I'm tired of worrying about what he's doing and I want to fix my eyes on the one who can take care of me. My stronghold, my strong tower, my strength, my rock, my redeemer. I want to reclaim that name of stronghold and give it as an attribute for my God. And I'm saying that the enemy can't build strongholds in your life? Absolutely. I 100% believe that he can. But our God is like, this is going to be a funny one. Uh, Our God is like the three little pigs. I'm telling you, there's, there's strongholds that are built of straw and sticks. But our stronghold is made of stone, of rock, a strong, firm foundation. The enemy cannot huff and puff and blow it down. He can't. I want to run to this stronghold. These other ones are defeatable. As I was praying over this message this week and doing the research into the word stronghold, uh, I came across Psalm 27, and I want to tell you there's a few ways that this psalm was confirmed to me this week. Um, as I was praying over what verses and where the Lord wants me to take it, uh, first and foremost, I was reading over this, and I read this on Thursday morning to Pastor Eric on the phone, and I was like, I think this might be the passage that we need to go towards. And Wes Willett gave me a book on Tuesday ca- talking about the presence of the Lord. And as I'm going through my routine in the morning, and I open this book to read, and it's day three, and day three starts off with Psalm 27. And then not an hour later, Candace is on Facebook and Charity Kimes posted on Thursday morning to read Psalm 27 over your family, to read it over your house, to read it over your life. I think that's a sign from God we need to read this book. I think that's a sign that we need to read Psalm 27 together. And so I'm going to do something that I've, I've never done before. One of the things the Lord is consistently drawing in to trust him more is to start throwing my notes out the window and to let to rely more on his word than on my notes. And he's drawing me away from my preparation and trusting and relying on my preparation because I'm pretty dependent on these notes most of the time. (laughs) He's pulling me away from that. So what he's asked us to do this morning is to read Psalm 27 together out loud and let's see what the Lord teaches us. In his word. You don't want to try that? So as an act, I'm going to step away from my notes. Are we ready? I'm excited about this. Okay, so Psalm 27 verse 1 says, The Lord... Okay, so I want to give you a warning. <laughs> On Sunday nights, we have a, I've been teaching a, a small group class, a connect group class, and we've been going through the book of Hebrews. And since the beginning of the semester, we're in verse 3. So I'm going to try to go a little faster tonight. Uh, I'm going to try to go a little faster tonight so you're not here that long. Uh, I'm going to try to get through all 14 verses, so let's just see what the Lord does. Okay, the Lord is my light. You guys know that it's almost impossible to talk about the glory of God without talking about the light that radiates and emanates in his presence. We, we know that from Moses, when he asked to see the glory of God, his face shone after he stood in the presence of God. We know that Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, his face shone like the sun. And we know that in Revelation 21, that in the end of times when we get to eternity, there's not going to need a need for stars or moon or suns because the glory of God is just going to shine everywhere. So when we talk about his light, my mind goes towards the glory of God. He is the light before my feet and the lamp to my path. He is the light of my life that shines in the darkness. I'm going to stop. And he is my salvation. You know, we don't need salvation unless there's something that you got to be saved from. And every single one of us here needs to be saved from our sin. Every single one of us are unified in the fact that we need a savior That we are all destined for an eternity in hell away from God. But he sent a savior to save us from that destination. And he took us off of that wide path and set our feet on the narrow path that can lead to life and peace. 
And he wants to do that for you. If you've never experienced his salvation, don't leave this place without asking him, how can you be saved from that destination? Also, salvation is not a one-time experience. Did you know that? I gotta be saved every day from my sins. I gotta be saved every day from my flesh, from my desires, from where I wanna go, my own desires, the things that I wanna do. I need him to save me from me every day, every moment of every day. When the Lord is my light and he is my salvation, really, who can we fear? I mean, really, I mean, if he is truly our salvation, does he fail at that? No. Who can we be afraid of? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Not just this area of my life. I don't just have him as the stronghold of my life on Sundays so that Mondays I can go back to living like the rest of the world, which I used to do. I do sometimes. I want him to be the stronghold of my entire life. I want him to set up a fortress around my world, my mind, my heart, my soul, everything about me. I want him to be the stronghold of my entire life. And when he is the stronghold of your entire life, who can you be afraid of? Of whom shall I be afraid? See, because we do have an enemy, and it, it, when evildoers assail us and try to eat our flesh, when enemies out there, we are fighting a war, but our battle is not against flesh and blood, it's against principalities in the spiritual realm. There is the enemy out there. He prowls around trying to steal, kill, and destroy. He's trying to come after your life. He's there. My adversary, I can't say that word, adversaries and foes, Oh man, think about this. When you're in the stronghold of the Lord, it's not you that trips and falls. He says, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. They can't even stand. They can't even walk right when I'm in the stronghold of the Lord. My enemies literally can't walk right. Though an enemy encamp against me, does that sound like a stronghold? An enemy encampment, a place where the enemy has taken up residence, has claimed territory, and says, this is mine. An enemy camps against me. My heart shall not fear. When war rises against me, because war is going to rise against you every day, there is a battle raging in the heavenlies for our souls, for the souls of this community, for your life. And even if that is happening, I will be confident. And even though all that's happening, even though there's strongholds, even though the enemy is raging, trying to come after me, even though there's a war raging, David in this instant teaches us the one thing that we should be asking for. The one thing. He says, one thing I have asked of the Lord and that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That's not eternity, y'all. That's not dwelling in his house in eternity. That's all the days of my life. Every day on this side of eternity, we need to be dwelling in the house of the Lord and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Y'all know there are so many attributes to him that we can't even comprehend. That if we were just take a moment and just take a day and just focus in on one attribute of God, we still would never fully comprehend it, but we could take some time to gaze on how beautiful he is. And he wants us to gaze at his beauty and to inquire in his temple. Other translations say meditate in his temple. Y'all know that... Um, Western philosophy and this new age philosophy of meditation is you go into a place where you're really quiet and you try to empty everything out of your mind, all your worries, all your thoughts. You pour your entire self out. You try to empty yourself to go into this void, this space of nothingness. Meditation on the Lord is not that. 
meditation on the Lord is you go before the presence of the Lord and you just fixate your mind on him. You set your focus on him and all the cares of the world will wash away. But when we're meditating on the presence of the Lord, when we're dwelling in his house and meditating on him, he will fill you up. It's not about emptiness. It's about being filled with him. Y'all, that's, verse 4 is the presence of the Lord. We've been, we sing about it and we talk about it. Verse 4 is the presence of the Lord. Y'all know we are the temple? We are now the temple of God. We are now the Holy Spirit's temple. He resides in us. His presence is always with us, even if we're not acknowledging it. He is always with us with us, but we are to dwell in the house of the Lord. That's the one thing that he asked for when war is raging around him. For, we, for he will hide me in the shelter in the day of trouble, and he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock, and now my head should be lifted up above my enemies all around me. When, he, when we hide in his temple, when we hide in his stronghold, when we dwell in his presence, our head is set above our enemies and we can't even see him. He raises us up to where our focus is not on the enemy, not on the war, not on the distractions, not on those that would come and destroy us. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices. Y'all, this is going to require sacrifices. For you to spend time in his presence, for you to really dwell in his presence, to gaze upon his beauty, to, to meditate in his temple, is going to require sacrifices of your time, of your energy, of your effort, of your sleep, of other things. It's going to require you to lay things down, but we can't be doing it begrudgingly, can we? Because it says that we offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. We shout joy when we sacrifice things to the Lord because he is going to ask. He's asking us to give it up because he's got something better to give you. And I will sing and make melody to the Lord. But sometimes in this world, sometimes in life, it is really difficult with all the enemy that goes on around us, all the distractions that are happening in this life and in this world, and they come up against us. The enemy is there. The strongholds are there. Sometimes we get really distracted and focus on those things, and we just have to cry out. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. See, even when we get distracted in the world, the Lord is saying, no, come back, come back, come back. Seek my face. Seek my presence. Seek me. Look, and my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. He says, hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you who have been my help, Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me. But the Lord will take me in. I didn't, that wasn't that hard to read in the first service. <laughs> my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord. Show me your path. Show me where you want me to go. Guide my steps. Show me your way. And lead me on a level path. Remove the stumbling blocks from me things in my sins in my life that distract me and make me fall. Make it a level path before my feet because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for the false witness has risen against me and they breathe out violence. But I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's not eternity. That's now. I believe that I get to look upon the goodness of the Lord in this life. 
We sang last night, we sang it, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. I want to see your goodness in my life in this side of eternity. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. And let your heart take courage. Isn't that interesting that it doesn't say be courageous. It says let your heart take courage from the one who's given you the courage. When you're in his presence, when you're dwelling in his presence, take courage from him. Let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. One of the things that the Lord has been teaching me lately is that Waiting for the Lord doesn't mean you sit back and do nothing. Doesn't mean that you don't continue advancing in his presence, advancing his kingdom. Waiting for the Lord does not mean that you just stop everything that you're doing. And Lord, I don't know what the next step is, so I'm not going to do anything. Waiting for the Lord means I know I'm supposed to take this step. I know I'm supposed to seek your presence. I know I'm supposed to read your word. I know I'm supposed to do these things. So when we're asked to wait, it doesn't mean we sit still. It means we still seek him and pursue his presence more and more every day. And sometimes that's the hardest part, isn't it? So there's a couple of main points that I have to get out that that comes from this passage that I feel like when we're on this topic of strongholds and we're on this idea of, of running to his presence being the greatest thing ever that has to be offered, the first point is this, is the Lord isn't our stronghold until he's the only one we run to. The Lord isn't truly our stronghold when we do like I do every other day and I try to take care of things myself. When I try to handle situations and problems by myself and I try to like, I I think I can figure this out so I go and take care of it myself or I go and ask for advice from friends or I go and I talk or I like try to distract my mind from thinking about the difficult things and God is generally the last thing that I turn to for my strength and my stronghold. When everything else has failed, well, I guess this is one we need to take to the Lord. That is not the way he's calling us to live. That's not the way he's calling me to live. He's calling me to live in his stronghold every day. He wants me to stay in his presence to where he is my strength. He is my guidance. He is my Lord. And base my, my, base my relationships, base my life off of his presence. We got into a little theological discussion this week in our staff this week about this term, seek his face. And we, we're like, okay, well, why do we have to seek his face? Is God hiding from us? Is he, is he somewhere else? Is he distant? Is he playing hide and seek? Is he playing something with us to where we have to go and look for him? No. The spirit of the Lord dwells within you. If you abide in him, he will abide in you. The spirit of God is constantly with you. We don't have to seek his face because he's off hiding somewhere. We have to seek his face and be intentional to seek his face because we seek every other solution first. We seek every other possible answer, every other solution before we seek his face. When he's saying, seek my face, be intentional about coming to him first. He's asking us to be, he wants to be the stronghold of our lives. He wants to be with us all the days of our life so that we can say things like better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere because he's calling us into his presence. But we also shouldn't just run to him when we need to be rescued or under attack. We are called to live constantly in his presence. And I know you're saying, well, okay, well, he, you, you just said that he's with us always, so aren't we always in his presence? Well, just like a couple of teenagers, you can be in a room with a teenager, but them not be acknowledging you at all. <laughs> I see that every Wednesday night. <laughs> room full of teenagers that are in the room with me, but they are just not acknowledging me at all. Am I in their presence? Yes. But they are not fixated on me. They're not listening to me at all. So when he's calling us to be in his presence consistently is to acknowledge his 
presence consistently, is to stay in his presence. So I ask these questions, I read these verses, and, and I ask, how are we doing with these? Proverbs 3, 6 says, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. Romans 8, 6 says, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So I ask, how are we doing with those verses? For me, I go, well, those are impossible verses. <laughs> those, are, those are impossible tasks. Like, you can't tell me that I have to pray constantly. Like, how, how is that physically possible, Lord? How can I physically thank you at all times? How can I acknowledge you in all my ways? These feel like impossible tasks in our lives. So most of us, if you're like me, most of us won't even take the first step down that path because we don't like goals that we feel like we can't accomplish. That's just me. I'm goal-oriented. I need to know that it's, accompl it's an accomplishable goal. But when God asks us to constantly be in his presence, to pray without ceasing, I go, I, I don't even know how to do that. And so I, I, I get fearful to even take that first step. And I get fearful to even step into that and walk towards that goal because I feel like it's impossible. But God wouldn't put it in his word if he wasn't meant for us to try to do it. He wouldn't have put it in there if it wasn't for us to make it a goal to achieve. Now, I can't say that anybody has ever achieved that. Maybe Enoch, maybe he got to the point to where he prayed so consistently and spent so much time in the presence of God that he just picked him up. I don't know. But all I know is that God's not asking me to focus so much on the always and constantly, but more today than I did yesterday. That's what he's asking me to do. He's asking me to pray more today than I did yesterday. He's asking me to communicate with him more today than I did yesterday. He wants me to sp fix my mind on the spirit more today than I did yesterday. He's asking me to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life more today than, he did, than I did yesterday. He's asking me to gaze upon his beauty more today than I did yesterday. He's asking me to meditate on his presence more today than I did yesterday. Those are achievable goals, aren't they? I mean, to me, that's an achievable task. Today, I want to spend more time, and I'm not keeping a clock, a stopwatch. I'm not just keeping a stopwatch. I'm not going to go to that. But what I want to say is at the end of my day, I want to come before the Father and know that I spent more time with him today than I have in before. I just want more of him, guys. I just want more of him in my life. I just want more of him in my mind. I just want more of him in my spirit. I just want more of him in my mouth. I want more of him in my ears. I want more of him. And this starts by taking baby steps. And fine, I'm taking some baby steps. I want to spend more of my life in communication in his presence than I did yesterday. Brother Lawrence is, a, is an old monk that, well, he was old, he's not alive anymore. Brother Lawrence is a, is a monk that lived a long time ago that wrote a book called The Practice of the Presence of God. And he started practicing being more in the presence of God by just saying, I love you to God more often throughout the day than when the Lord would be brought to his mind or when the Lord would do something and he saw God, he would just respond with, I love you, I love you, I love you. There's another book I'm reading called the Paul Miller's the prayer the a praying praying a praying life a praying life. He said he would just say the name of Jesus consistently through his day in his mind to just, just keep renewing his mind to keep it fixated on God. I gotta take some steps to get some control up here. I have to. I'm tired of being stuck in the rut and the routine of the same way that I've always done things. I'm tired of going through my day and feeling like, well, this day was worse than the day before. I want to see more of him in my life today than I saw of yesterday. And I have to take baby steps. We got to get practical with this. 
We got to get in an area. I'm not saying that that's word. I'm saying for me, that's what I'm trying. And that's what I'm doing. I'm going to spend more of my day acknowledging him that when the Lord gets brought to my mind or gets impressed on my heart, I start speaking to him. I love you, Lord. Thank you for my family. Thank you. Just consistently learning how to communicate with him throughout my day. And this isn't some legalistic, this isn't some works-based thing. I just want to be able to change up here, and I got to start it somehow. And I don't know what the Lord's asking us to do, but I feel like that as we've gone through this, this year of all these message series and all these things of pushing us and identifying the things in our lives that don't need to be there, we've been casting off, we've been confessing, we've been seeking for revival. I need it up here. I need it up here. I've got to start with this mind, this renewing of my mind. I've got to get it out of the nasty routine that it's in. I want more of him and less of me. I want to learn how to pray without ceasing. I want to learn how to give thanks in all circumstances. And this is a practical thing that I have to learn how to do. See, I think that this, though, in my mind, I think that this is how we experience freedom. I really do. I think that this is how chains are broken in our lives. I really think that this is how, uh, was it your dad used to, used to say, stop the stinking thinking? This is how we stop the stinking thinking. This is how we cast off these things in our mind and stop the way that the world and my flesh wants to do things. I've got to break the cycle. I got to somehow. So if you get a better way, please let me know at the end of the message. Otherwise, this is what I'm going for. I'm trying to focus more on his presence because I think that it's in his glory that he's asking me to live. It's in his glory. It's in this gift of his glory that we come into his presence to praise him, to thank him, to acknowledge him throughout my day, to give him praise that he is worthy, to give him glory. And whenever I sit and rest in his presence, I sit and rest in his glory, and he bestows his glory upon me. That's where I get to experience his life, his peace, his joy. I actually get to experience those fruits of the spirit that we talk about often. I want to experience all that, and that happens in his presence. We've been, we've been so fixated throughout this, this history of Christianity. I'm talking about get in the quiet time, get in your quiet time, and it is 100% necessary and amazing to spend time in the word of God and to fixate your mind in specific focused, focused prayer every morning of your life. It will change your life, but don't close the door to his presence when you leave that quiet time. He's calling us to walk in his presence throughout the day. That should be an ignition for a fire that burns throughout our entire day. Not, I did the check marks, I accomplished those things, now back into my old routine. I want that time to open the door into the rest of my day. I want to spend time in his glory and his presence and then carry his glory and his presence with me throughout the day. And that's where I want to go with you. I want to, are y'all okay with going with me on that? I want to go down that path in my life. I want to see his glory change. I want to experience the greatness of my God so that I can sing songs like better is one day in your court and mean them. I want to be able to sing songs like there's no one better than you and mean it. I want to be able to sing songs like in Christ alone my hope is found and I want to mean it. I want to mean the things that we sing and it's going to happen by me being practical and sitting down on my knees and changing my mindset and fixating it more on him throughout my day. 